What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and this is the Meat Blog Podcast. Weekly podcast by butchers for everyone. And if this is your first time joining us, I just want to say welcome. And if you are a recurring listener, then welcome back. In this episode, we're going to talk about substances in the meat industry. Um, you know, coffee, uh, things that keep keep you going, keep things that help help the aches and pains. You know how you know Friday night could bleed into Monday morning, and how something that you thought was uh, you know under control may steadily creep up and be completely out of control. Anyway, I hope you enjoy. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. All right. Um, this is Travis. Way before I was a butcher in a, another life, a lifetime ago, it feels like, um, I work construction. I've always worked manual labor jobs. I've always considered myself working class. And blue collar or, or whatever. Um, and as a result of that, when I would, would work tile, I'd work with these old timers, like any industry, like the meat industry. There's the old timers, and eventually one day I'll be an old timer in this industry. But at the end of the day of setting tile or redoing a bathroom or, or something like that, we would, you know, clock out and meet at the nearest bar next to the job site. And it, it was, well, we knew all the bars in Santa Barbara and we would always end up there at 4.30 and have a couple of drinks and it would just make the drive home a little bit easier. You know, and on Fridays, we would go out to lunch and go ha- uh, drink our lunch. And usually we would draw straws or send the new guy back to the job site to pack up our shit for the weekend after we've had a couple. Our boss knew to, you know, swing by these bars in relation to where we were working and drop off our paychecks sometimes. Or when we would go to his house and pick up our paychecks, he would have a, you know, offer us a cocktail and we would have some. And it was very uh, drinking. What Drinking was accepted. It wasn't shunned upon and or or anything like that, you know, at 10 o'clock breaks, we would head out and maybe have a Bloody Mary someplace, and at lunch, we would probably have a Long Island. And these guys, you know, these old-timers would talk about back in the day, and this guy and that guy, and, you know, talked about how much blow they used to do and how much work they could get done. And it was like a dare campaign. Where if you remember D.A.R.E. in middle school, they would bring all the drugs and pretty much tell you explicitly how to use it and how awesome they are. And I was in my early 20s, so my Friday nights would bleed into Monday mornings. And, you know, about 2 a.m. on a Saturday, we would, me and my friends would make a phone call and, or, and I don't know how it happened. But cocaine started being brought into the mix. I was dating this girl at the time who did it before we started dating and certainly did it once we broke up. And I don't I don't think she introduced me to it. I think it was more around. And I was like, hey, I want some of that. Now, a good friend of mine, Adam Cole, once told me doing cocaine, it's like having a tool belt on that makes you feel like you're powerful enough to take apart the world. And I would say, I I would agree with that, but cocaine to me, like people always have this thing like, oh, it's never as good as your first time. I could tell you it may never be as good as your first time, but it's certainly way better when you're, than when you're not on it. Uh, And the only problem I ever had with cocaine was not being able to afford it. And when you want something that you can't afford, it becomes a big fucking problem. It becomes everybody's problem. 
if you remember during the aches and pains episode, I talked about how I'm diagnosed with bipolar and the combination of cocaine psychosis and manic depression is an amazing, powerful, fucked up force. And I ended up getting several boxer fractures in a row. Uh, not like I blacked out and came to in my hand, was in a cast, flash forward three months, I get that cast off. And like deja vu, it happened again. It's not one of those cool stories like you should see what the other guy looks like. The other guy was a piece of sheer wall in the bathroom of a bar. And he was fine. And he showed up twice, uh, you know, in several different bathrooms. But same incident. I would get drunk, cuss myself out in the mirror after having a super passive aggressive argument with the girl I was dating and uh, wake up with a broken hand. One of these incidences was on Halloween, which was pretty exciting. Now, this is in like 2007, 2006 time frame. And back then, it was, there wasn't really a opioid crisis, quote unquote. But what there was, was shit ton of opioids. Because when I broke my hand, I was prescribed some amazing uh, narcotics to help me with my pain, a boxer's fracture. And when you're already drinking every night of the week and doing copious amounts of cocaine and you're just giving multiple subscription or prescriptions to oxycodone and Vicodin, and the doctor saying, oh, if this one isn't strong enough, just go get this script filled. And this is the strongest they make this medication with uh, two refills per of 60 pills. And then so I was, so I had the equivalent of nine, no, 12 refills from my two hand breaks within four months. And it was pretty great. And I'll continue this after David talks about how this actually relates to our industry. Hey gang, David here. We all know stories and stereotypes that kind of revolve around the food industry about alcoholics, drug use, late nights, just general wild behavior. I know when I worked in the restaurant industry, I was certainly a part of it, at least in the beginning of my career. I met all kinds of folks, uh, very few of which, though, went to bed early, ate healthy, drank enough water. Most of us were under a ton of stress, whether it was because we were trying to achieve our own goals or trying to live up to somebody else's expectations, working underneath a, a fire-breathing chef or head butcher, or trying to keep up with an incredibly fast pace. You know, I had uh, one job at a breakfast spot. It was a place that was open for 35 years, and everybody went there, and we'd do about 800 covers on a Saturday or Sunday morning. And that was extremely stressful. And in that kitchen, there were two boxes of wine on top of the refrigerator, and everybody poured from them all day like it was a keg at a party or something. Everybody had a glass of wine all morning, every day. And it was encouraged from the top down. I didn't think much of it then, but as my career progressed, I started to see some patterns in myself that um, I'll tell you a little bit about later. First, I've got a story about a guy that I used to work with. This is uh, at a Sicilian place that I was working at in the Northwest. We had this new sous chef that came in. He was super bright, really enthusiastic, very passionate, hard worker. Uh, very, very friendly, super outgoing, and really liked to go out with everybody after the shift. You know, we'd go out to this spot that, of course, 
in this particular city, bars closed down at one thirty, but we knew the owners. This was a small spot kind of off the, the main drag and we would go and we would show up after dinner service. Um, at the time I was working during the day and then did, um, production, pastry, baking, pasta making, whatnot. Um, in the early evenings and I'd get out at about seven o'clock, I'd go home, walk my dog, unwind for a little bit, do some house, you know, apartment chores or whatever. And then I'd meet up with everybody else after dinner service at like 1030 at this place. And we'd go and eat and drink aggressively until four or five in the morning, go home, pass out, wake up, do it again. Well, this particular fella would really get after it. You know, I mean, I'm talking, he's in the door and he's had five shots before he can even say hello to everybody. And every single night, this fella, we'll call him uh, Rick. Rick was blackout drunk every single night. Now, I wasn't a mean drunk. He didn't, you know, fall down slobbering and crying or anything like that. He was super fun, really, really friendly, but got blackout drunk every single night. And as I got to know the guy a little bit more, I kind of found out he had had a pretty rough go of it. You know, um, I think he had some some various issues about uh, his personal orientation and and identifying and finding his place in the world. And I know that he had also gotten into a really, really severe traffic accident that had left him um, with some really intense skeletal damage in his neck and face and and also had a a little bit of brain damage um, from it that had been really difficult to get over and it was really quite traumatic and and uh, sometimes that would come out when you'd be drinking you'd hear about that Uh, really fun guy to work with though but you could tell that he had some really intense and, and sometimes destructive behavior patterns so anyways, we didn't really think much of it because there, there were lots of people we worked with that had this sort of tendency, you know. Um, so fast forward. Uh, one day, I'm down in the basement. I, I had my own kitchen in this place where I did all of my production after I got done with daytime service. And I had a small cooler down in a basement that was kind of hidden. The door to the basement wasn't really obvious. And so we had this extra basement where we stored you know, root vegetables and, and winter squashes and all these really great storage vegetables from awesome farmers that we worked with one on one, um, who I wish I could all name right now, but I can't. So we also, there was also a secret room where we had this old stand up Pepsi display cooler that we had converted into a small curing chamber. We didn't do anything crazy in it. You know, we did like quote unquote duck breast prosciutto. Which was kind of goofy, but honestly, you know, cured duck breast. It's uh, it's air cured and dried and shaved on a salad. is It's pretty nice, honestly. Uh, even though it is a bit of a gimmick, it is really quite delicious. So, you know, we do duck, we do cured duck breast. We do um, a little bit of pancetta. We did some Lomo down there. We did a couple copas. I think we did some lamb copa. Just, some di- you know, different fun little projects that we could throw on our charcuterie board. Um, much to the chagrin of the local health department. But anyways, we got this little cooler. I'd go down there and, and check it out and check on everything once in a while and, you know, uh, actually quite regularly and make sure everything's where it's supposed to be and check humidity and make sure that, that everything's just dialed in. And um, One day I was going to clean behind it and, you know, I pulled it out a little bit. It was empty. We didn't have anything curing in there at the moment. And I pulled the thing out and I heard a, a crash behind it. And so I looked behind this cooler and holy shit, there was bottles and bottles and bottles, empty bottles, empty glass bottles of liquor. And not just any liquor. I mean, most of it was high end and it was things that we served at the restaurant. So it was like Michter's Rye, uh, Woodford Reserve. There was, um, the hell was back there some really nice whiskeys there was some bombay sapphire some beef eater di- different liquors of all types and a stack of everclear and that was that was the most recent i assumed because it was the bottles that were closest to where you'd have to reach your arm behind 
to set it down. And we went through cases and cases of Everclear at this place because we made our own limoncello. Uh, I've got a great recipe for limoncello that you can make using a combi oven in case anybody's interested, as a side note. Uh, really quite delicious. And I almost immediately knew who it was because our friend Rick, I had, I had noticed on Saturday and Sunday services, especially Sundays, because none of the managers were there except for him, him being the sous chef. Uh, we didn't have a lot of customers, didn't have a lot of business. And I had noticed after brunch, when he had come in, that he, he'd be kind of slurry, you know, and I thought maybe it was because he had had a really rough night the night before and he wasn't quite into it, you know, and he'd kind of complain about being hungover. But I noticed that he'd get like more motivated and more energetic, yet more slurry as the night went on on Sunday nights. And I, I thought, well, this guy's drinking, you know, um, and I had my suspicions, but I couldn't quite figure it out. And now I had been able to put two and two together. And I was put into a difficult position, and I didn't quite know what to do. And I was really wrestling with whether I should tell management or confront him. And actually, uh, the whole thing righted itself because serendipitously, the GM had gone down to the basement um, to check on my cleaning job while I was out having a smoke or something like that. And he found them too, uh, within a couple of days of me finding them, you know, so that situation righted itself and, and, uh, everybody kind of knew who it was off the bat and, you know, he came forward and, and, um, came to responsibility and then he left, he quit, you know, right on the spot out of kind of embarrassment, I think, and shame. And he left and nobody heard from him for a long time. And I actually have no idea how he is now and I hope he's all right, but, um, the point is, is, is that this guy didn't get drunk at work because he just liked to be drunk. He just had incredible amounts of stress and didn't know how to deal with them. And alcohol was a way to kind of quell that and dial it back. And I'm sure we've all had experiences like that. I, I know that I have. Um, something I don't particularly like to talk about, but I will just for the, the sake of conversation here, when I was much, much younger, um, this is a very long time ago, half my life over ago, um, I was a young person, was under a shit ton of stress, and just happened to get injured and had to have a minor surgery. And when I got out of the surgery, I was prescribed a liquid painkiller, tasted like delicious push pops, sweet orange cream. And I remember, you know, taking the prescribed dosage, I believe it was liquid morphine of some kind or something like that, some opiate. Um, I was prescribed this stuff to make me feel better, to help me through the surgery. And I remember taking the allotted amount and I've always been a real big, you know, big guy. I'm, I'm tall. I've got a big frame. Everything I take, I take twice more. You know, if, if, if you give yourself two pieces of pizza, you give me five. You know, if, if I'm going to take ibuprofen, I don't take two, I take four. I've always been that way. And so I remember taking a double dose of whatever this stuff was to make me feel better. Next thing I knew, I felt the complete absence of stress. I felt better than I had ever felt in my entire life in that moment. I felt good. I felt happy. I felt no stress, no pressure, no conflict. I felt sure of myself. I felt confident. I felt like I could get through everything. It slowed me down. I could sort through all of my problems. I could really get all my ducks in a row. And that moment was the beginning of a torrid love affair that I had with opiates that only, thank goodness, and I feel very blessed for this, it only lasted for about a year. And that's because I got caught. You know, I, I got in some trouble and was forced to quit, which is really great. And I don't have any sort of record now, you know, because I was, I was very young and, um, I learned a lesson there, but you know, so my, any sort of like long-term addiction never materialized, uh, from this incident with opiates and I never touched them again. That being said, it took me many years after that to figure out how to, manage stress without the help of self-medicating. 
Self-medication, according to psychology uh, today, begins with oftentimes a couple smokes of a cigarette, maybe a few drinks, a Xanax, something like that, right? But over time, our brain builds receptors that require these substances to achieve that state of serenity. So, you know, like my experience, I ingest this substance, I feel better. In that moment, you create some different neural pathways that feel that that begin to feel better and you train yourself to to associate these substances with a lack of anxiety or a lack of depression over time you construct more and more and more of these receptors so it takes more and more of these substances to achieve that lack of anxiety Specifically in our industry, I mean, this isn't just the restaurant industry. This is this is the butcher shop too. You know, uh, alcohol and opiates are are the big thing in our business, and probably that has to do not only with the lack of you know uh, and assisting with reducing anxiety, but also because opiates are used to treat pain. Who is in more systemic pain than people that work in this industry? Like we spoke of a, a couple. A few episodes ago, you know, carpal tunnel, pinched nerves, abbreviated discs, compressed lumbar, pulled muscles, torn ligaments, all these things are very, very painful. And a lot of people live with them every day because it's an industry that historically has been all about men the fuck up, bro, you know, work harder, work faster. Oh, you must be getting old because you can't keep up. Maybe you're working yourself out of a job. Maybe you can't keep up and you can't stay head butcher and work the saw. We're going to stick you back in the trim room or you're going to become the new ham pumper. I used to work with a guy like that. He was a longtime meat cutter. He'd worked for 30 years. He had terrible arthritis in his knees because he worked on concrete every day with no anti-fatigue mats whatsoever. He, for various other reasons, was extremely depressed, didn't like himself, and drank like crazy every night and he took opiates and I remember one day he was at work and he was having a particularly difficult time and he was on the floor and he had had just had a big blow up with all the coworkers and was kind of confiding in with in me and he said you know fuck this place I'm out of here I'm looking for another job this is it this is the last straw I'm sick of having to go home every single night and drink myself to sleep just to cope with this shit and that's honestly how he saw his position was that the job caused him to do these things, to harm himself in order just to get some sleep and some reprieve from the pressure. Anxiety comes from a lot of different angles in this business. Perhaps you work for yourself and you're just trying to make ends meet, make margins. Perhaps you work for somebody else and... You just want to stay in the good graces, but you feel yourself aging. Perhaps you're new. You're new to the business, and you just want to get to the top, and you want to do your best, and you you feel a ton of pressure because you want to perform like everybody else around you. Perhaps you have a family to support. You're having a difficult time bringing home enough money. Maybe you've got different financial burdens or social burdens or, or anything. I mean, there's so many different things that cause anxiety, and it honestly... None, it, it's, it's unfair to put them on a scale. You know, I mean, I witnessed a conversation recently where someone was talking about their hardships and they were explaining why they weren't, ha- why they weren't able to show up for work a lot. And they, they had kind of been blowing up at people and hadn't been their normal selves. And they said, well, I had to do this and this and this and this recently. And, and I'm having all of these difficulties with my kids and with my student debt and, uh, I'm not making enough money and my health is failing. And the the manager came back and said, and this was, this was a while ago, actually. The manager came back and said, oh, well, well, I had to do this and my wife just died of cancer and my kid did this. And, and basically like kind of put this other person's problems down in such a way that they seem totally invalid. And what do you think that person did? Probably went home and got fucked up. It's really, it's, it's not helpful at all to put, different people's neuroses and, and problems on a scale of um, like it, 
an objective scale because it is so subjective. Now, we're not drug counselors or psychologists here, but I can speak from a little bit of experience. I was very, very fortunate um, to have some different people come into my life and kind of teach me some things about how to experience joy and, and uh, happiness in a day to day. When I worked in the restaurant industry, like I said before, um, I was never drunk at work, but due to the fast pace and the heat and the pressure and what I consider to be very, very high anxiety, I and everybody else on the line always had a beer open or a glass of wine. Some days it was a full 16 ounce pint of red wine. Some days it was a shot of whiskey after every couple hours. It's just something to numb it, something to take the edge off. And that's, that's the behavior that, that's really sneaky and really subversive because the people that get shit canned at work, you know, that's, that's one thing. That's, that's its own sort of problem, but it's, it's the, it's a self medicating where you can justify it. That's really dangerous. Oh, well, it's just been this little bit. Oh, well, I just, I haven't been drunk. I've just had a couple drinks here and there. Well, I just keep it to one drink an hour. I can metabolize that. No big deal. Well, I, you know, I, I didn't drink any of the other days this week. So I figure, you know, if I start drinking at 8 a.m. and stop at 8 p.m. and have one drink an hour, it's only 12 beers and, and 12 beers throughout the course of a week. If I don't drink any other days, is that's fine. You know, it's, it's different justifications that become really dangerous. These are all symptoms, though, of a greater problem, and that's treating anxiety. And I'm sure that in the future we're going to have another episode about anxiety in general, but I can, I can tell you from my experience that a lot of my anxiety comes from being a perfectionist, come from being a workaholic, and come, uh, it comes from how I define my self-worth as a man and as a person and as a member of society. I define that, or have in the past defined it, uh, as my success as a worker. You know, in my early 20s, I really fucked off quite a bit and didn't, didn't really have much of a work ethic. I found it at one point in my mid-20s. And ever since then, I've been a workaholic. I've never stopped. And I've been a perfectionist my entire life. And if I'm not living up to the, to the expectations that I've set for myself that I'm not going to stop until I have. And if I fail, I'm going to continue. Then if I succeed, rarely do I stop and enjoy what I've done, but I instead look for the next hurdle and say, okay, well, I've licked this, so now I'm on to the next one. This isn't enough. Let's move on. And I tell myself, it's not going to be good until this particular hurdle has been cleared. It's a very poisonous line of thinking because it's never good enough. It's never there. It's never enough. And when you get going down that rabbit hole, it's very, very easy to self-medicate, to take that pressure off. Some things that I've kind of learned over the last few years, and I I know a lot of you out there are probably going to think that this is kind of woo-woo and and, uh, whatnot, but... Just hear me out. Some things that have helped me. Well, first, I guess I ought to say my, my self medicating, I was able to grow out of or work, work out of uh, quite a while ago. So I've got a little bit more perspective now. Um, so here's, here's what I'll say I had someone come into my life that taught me about joy. And about experiencing joy. And about allowing myself to experience it. And another thing that was really, really important was being taught how to like really lean into emotions, feelings, and thoughts as opposed to trying to dull them. You know, because the way I see it is if, you, if you've got this anxiety or this anger and then you dull it with some substance, it's still there when the substance wears off. It's just... It's grown. It's compounded. You know, so I'd have all this anxiety. 
when I was in the restaurants and I would, I would dull it, dull it, dull it, dull it, dull it. And then Saturday would come around and Friday night I couldn't sleep worth a damn. I just have anxiety. And it was because I was kind of coming down from the week and all of that built up stress was, I was now feeling it. I had somebody that I was, um, his name's Larry. I was very, very fortunate to meet Larry. Larry was a friend, but he was also, uh, a counselor, and I was able to talk to him, and he taught me about leaning into emotions and feelings. So when you feel anxiety about something, really let yourself feel it in its entirety, and really lean into it, really let it go wild, and just but notice it, notice how you're feeling, notice what your body is doing, notice your physical reactions, your physical symptoms of the anxiety, notice your thoughts the different thoughts that are competing for your attention all at the same time. You know, these thoughts exist for a reason. These thoughts that compete for your attention in the form of anxiety are all primal thoughts that are tied into natural selection, things that that want to get you to do something. You know, whether it's work harder, eat now, go have sex now, go drink something. And there's there's a reason for it. Most of them have to do with distracting you from anxiety. But if you lean into these things and really feel them, sometimes you can notice them for what they are. And sometimes if you practice that over a long period of time, they'll start to go away and they'll start to quiet down because you're not giving them the positive reinforcement that they're asking for. Another thing that really helped me over time was a conscious effort to budget my time and inadvertently that made me a little bit less of a workaholic. I mean, don't get me wrong. I still work seven days a week. Six of them are 12 to 16 hour days. And one of them is a a more leisurely eight hour day. That's just what it is. But I've forced myself to set aside small amounts of time to do things that are really important to me. So now I have, um, now I have, a policy where once a month, if at all possible, it's not always possible, but it's a standing order where once a month I get out of town for one night. Even if it's just Saturday morning, I hop in my car and I take off up north, stay in a cabin or a tent for the night and come back down. Sometimes maybe I'll drive to Chicago. I'll stay there and I'll have one great dinner, one great breakfast, and I'll come back. If I don't have any money, which is fairly often, you know, especially when it's not harvest season. I might just take my tent and go to the back of my property and camp out. Or I'll call a friend that's got property and say, Hey man, can I come can I come camp out on your on your parcel in the back of the section? It's just getting away and recharging with silence. That doesn't work for everybody. Some people are more social than I am. I tend to be a fairly extreme introvert. Some people are really extroverted. And that may mean going to a more, you know, densely populated area and talking to people and spending time. Another thing that really helped me was devoting time to hobbies. I don't really have a lot in the way of hobbies that aren't work-related. Um, I do play guitar. I used to be a more serious musician, and now it's just just kind of a bunch of wankery, honestly, but it's fun. And even if I can only get five or 10 minutes here and there, it really helps me out a lot. It makes me feel like a whole person, you know? Another thing that has really helped me decrease my anxiety and the pressure that I feel is getting a good night's sleep. I mean, when we used to be in that schedule, when I first started, or when I was working in the restaurant, or when I first started in the meat industry, I mean, we'd work until close, and then we'd go out and drink all night. Then we'd go home and sleep like shit because we drank all that. And then we'd wake up four or five hours later, do it all again. Over time, this is hell on your system. Your immune system is is trashed. So is your brain. You can't think. You can't reason. Your personality is a little bit different when you don't sleep a lot. The year that I started devoting a minimum seven hours of sleep a night was the night that I started to feel differently. It was just one more tool in my toolbox to work towards lessening the anxiety, lessening the pressure, and lessening the urge to self-medicate. These are just a few things uh, that have really helped me out a lot. You know, 
uh, I'd say maybe one of the last things I want to mention are setting realistic expectations and goals. Because, you know, don't forget, the the journey, like the building of your personal empire, the work to get you where you want to go, the the saving of the money, the the building of your resume, that's the fun part. When that's over, you know, then what? Then you're going to be on to something else. You're going to be on to a new career or you're going to be on to retirement or you're just, I, I mean, I don't even know what it looks like. Don't forget that the part, the, the part where you're chasing after that which you want, that's the fun part. The hunt is what's great. So enjoy it while you're in this right now because you're never going to be able to be in the spot where you are right now again. And even though it's anxiety laden occasionally or, or there's a lot of pressure or there's some depression or you fail sometimes, not always, it's still better than not existing at all, you know? And so... So my advice for those of the, those of us out there that maybe are struggling with some self medicating is not about trying to it's not trying to quit whatever it is that you medicate with. That's just a symptom. It's just a crutch. You know, you quit smoking, you quit drugs, quit alcohol. It might become weightlifting or running or dieting or going home with sleaze balls. I mean. You know what I mean? I think you do. It's really about addressing what it is that makes you feel so much anxiety and so much pressure and getting to the root of that and figuring out how to lessen that and live a more reasonable life with more reasonable expectations of yourself and enjoying the path that you're on currently. And I know that's easier said than done because I'm not speaking from a place of extreme drug addiction. I know that I'm probably oversimplifying that and I don't mean to. And I am very fortunate that I haven't had to ever really experience um, any immersive addiction. So for that sort of thing, just know that you have our support. And if anybody needs anything or any resources, please you know, feel free to contact us and, and at least myself, please feel free to contact me uh, and I'd be happy to point you in any direction that I can. Um, but for anybody that identifies this or with this um, and is having a hard time kind of getting through the pressures of the, the everyday without needing a crutch or, or self-medicating, um, just know that you've got a great network of people in this industry that probably feel the same way. You've got a great network of, of people here at, at the podcast, the three of us. Um, and there's a ton of people that feel the same way that you do. So I really suggest reaching out if you need to, uh, because, because there's people to prop you up and you, you're not alone in, in, um, in any sort of addiction or, or, you know, uh, cycle of unhealth, mental or physical. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, I relate with a lot of that. Uh, even though I've never worked in a kitchen and hopefully never will. Not saying it's bad. But anyway, back to my story. So by the time I was running out of opiates and I was getting better and had to go back to work. Uh, one weekend, I ended up spending about $5,000 on, uh, I couldn't even tell you. Um, and I just lost it. Uh, it was the end. And I, I think I realized that b before it really started, but I realized that this was it. I was full blown manic. And going crazy, and I knew that there was a big crash coming. And I don't know if it's hindsight or if I knew at the time that the crash was going to result in my death. Uh, so this weekend, I ended up getting into a, a big uh, verbal disagreement 
and at the place where I was living and went outside for a cigarette and just never went back inside. And I was living with my girlfriend at the time. And I went outside and called my parents and asked for help probably for the first time I was in double digits of age. And it was raining. I'm not saying that for dramatic effect. It was probably the two nights a year that it was raining in Santa Barbara. And they picked me up and took me to where I asked. I requested I need to go to detox. And I went to a detox facility called Five East Cottage Hospital. I was introduced to Bill Wilson. I had a sponsor by the time I left. And, you know, it was your first make make a meeting every day for 90 days. And, you know, it works if you work it. You know, AA or NA. And I felt like I just mentally changed one addiction for another. I was still able to chain smoke and drink all the coffee and then... uh Instead of going to bars, I was now going to meetings. But one thing I never liked about the program is how it viewed mental health. That they look down on certain things such as is psychotropics that people need to have their mood stable. So I developed a weird guilt around it to the point where I just stopped going to meetings because I just was just a conversation that I didn't want to have with people who one weren't doctors and were just, yeah, I I, I don't know. I think that it would probably have more success and be able to help more people if they were to put that shit in check. I decided to do a bunch of traveling. That's when I went to Sri Lanka. I, I ended up hooking up with a band that I was friends with that I used to live with. Um, you know, part of the, that hardcore straight edge scene. And we, I went on the road with them for months, saw America, drove across it probably six or seven times. Now, when you see America through being on the road with a band, it's, you're seeing recognizable cities, every city you've ever heard of in America, but you're only seeing it at night and for a few hours. So it's not as great as you would think. Money was running out, and about this time, my brother was saying, hey, you're going to be broke soon, you know, because I was a tile setter and a slew of my injuries and things of that nature, and it was 2008. The, there was no work, um, you know, there in, especially living in Santa Barbara, I needed I needed to support uh, myself and I couldn't certain it was just not feasible to do so at the time. So I moved to Vermont to be in the meat industry and I've gone over that story before, but one part of the story that I haven't talked about or because I knew we were going to do this episode, it was something that I wanted to talk about is the substance abuse I saw working in the, processing end of the meat industry it's not like hidden it's just like like right there and i'll talk more about that after ryan many guys i've worked with have had uppers of various kinds offered to them at some point in their career either by bosses or coworkers. this can occur in game processing outfits and custom exempt and also in USDA companies or really anywhere that sees a huge workload demand and too few workers. When your company is getting paid by the head, which is to say paid by the number of carcasses you can cut in a day, there will be some pressure felt to maintain an earnest pace of work and productive capacity. The wild game cutting season is characterized by tidal waves of deer and elk carcasses filling cooler after cooler to capacity. Maybe your shop can 
pick up some extra help from a backlog of grocery store meat cutters who come in to cut on their weekends, but this is not a guarantee. Those grocery store meat cutters will not necessarily be available right when your coolers are bursting with uh, elk and deer and bear or whatever you have. The burden will inevitably fall very heavily on the select few full-time meat cutters at the shop. At its best, these busy periods of time can be incredibly fun. Life becomes very simple. Work ends up taking every ounce of your energy, 12-hour days or more sometimes. Eat, sleep, and work is all there is to your existence. There's great focus and camaraderie in the workplace. There's a great feeling of teamwork, a great feeling of purpose. The boss comes in to help cut alongside you. Lunches are often paid for. The music is blasting and the banter is lively. When everything lines up, when your heart is in it, when your body's feeling strong, when you're young and healthy and are deriving great meaning from your work, everything can work out just fine. But when things aren't lining up so well, when physical health or mental health becomes impaired, there still exists the same amount of work that needs to get done. Guys will sometimes turn to substances to help them get through. This dynamic exists not just in the game processing sector. It is present wherever there is high volumes of work to be done and pressures, either self-imposed or imposed from the outside, pressures to perform consistently at a high level. Many custom-exempt and USDA facilities experience high workloads periodically through the year, or in some cases all year long. You'll hear rumors about shops where all the meat cutters and wrappers are on meth. I talk about meat cutters and slaughtermen a lot, but I don't talk enough about meat wrappers. Meat wrappers can have huge demands placed on them during busy times in high-volume cut and wrap facilities. They have to be skilled at paper wrapping. They have to be very well organized and very fast at what they do. Every steak in lugger after lugger of steaks and roasts has to be identified, has to be hot sealed in two layers of plastic, depending on if that's the practice at at your facility. Then it has to be hand wrapped in two layers of paper, if vacuum sealing isn't an option. Carpal tunnel and burnout can be a barrier to keeping good meat wrappers. These folks are are busy. In the end, I don't think meat cutting is all too different than many other blue-collar professions in regards to the majority of the substance abuse issues that we see. In some communities, you might see a great deal of meth being circulated. In others, other places, you might see more of a heroin issue or uh, the street narcotic on a street opioid, less expensive version of her- heroin. These things plague the whole communities, not just the meat cutting sector. Whether these types of drugs are tolerated in the workplace or encouraged, even is often based more upon the size of the business and the preferences of the owner or manager. The smaller the company is, the more unorthodox behavior and management styles can permeate without being called into question. Small meat shop culture can be similar to restaurant culture in this way. There's these small outposts which are these small businesses of restaurant or meat shops or butcher shops, and they can be governed by a very different set of rules as compared to larger, more visible corporate companies. It can be like working on a boat out at sea. There's the guy that owns and operates the boat. He's running the show. 
either you get with the program or you're not going to last long. If you don't like that the boss, for example, throws things and screams at employees sometimes, then it might not be the right place for you. If ladies aren't willing to tolerate a certain amount of sexual harassment in the workplace, then it might not be a good fit for a place to work. Whatever the situation is, at the small business level there can exist a kind of boys club dynamic and it's difficult to hold people accountable for their actions within that boys club dynamic. The rules are more flexible as compared to the rules that govern bigger businesses. And this can be both a blessing and a curse, depending. The leniency and flexibility of small businesses can be very refreshing when there exists a fair and considerate management style. Everyone gets to know each other very well in these small businesses. It can be very intimate, very family-like. Individuals can come away with a great sense of duty and purpose feeling their work is valued and that they're important members of a team rather than a cog in the wheel of a nameless, faceless corporate machine. Good bosses can work out very fair arrangements with their employees that everyone comes away feeling good about. But still, each company has its idiosyncrasies. And at the small business level, these things are even more amplified Several small shops I've worked at had kegs of beer in the walk-in refrigerator and liquor free-flowing in the office. The culture of the shop encouraged regular beer breaks throughout the day and ceremonial shots at noontime, which also sometimes then became 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. in addition. This is a good example of the double-edged sword that is the leniency and flexible nature of small business. On one hand, it's really nice to have a beer at work with your coworkers during a slow portion of the day. On the other hand, the presence of alcohol at work can be a slippery slope for many otherwise responsible folks. As companies grow in size and gain more employees, they often have to tighten up their shop etiquette in accordance one such company I worked for had recently grown and was in the process of tightening up company rules. They still kept the keg in the walk-in. There was still a keg in the walk-in cooler. But the new rule was that the employees were only allowed to tap it at the end of their workday. When it came to weed, there was much more tolerance. Guys were allowed to have safety meetings. Safety meeting would be when a number of guys take a break together to take bong rips in someone's pickup truck. The boss would look the other way for this. But on more pertinent issues such as harassment, there is introduced a code of conduct as outlined in an employee handbook. This, is a, this I think, is a smart move. Employee handbooks are just one small component of affecting a healthy workplace culture. Yet they can help with creating clearer expectations. Though I prefer working for smaller business, I still like to draw from big business mindsets regarding how to treat each other with respect in the workplace. I don't like the ego trip that some small business owners can have. And I very, I very much like it if there exists an HR person or some other checks and balances system in place. In regards to substances, things just seem tidier when they are kept out of the workplace. So working in a slaughter, I, I, I would see these guys and it's mostly the, the trimmers or, you know, uh, and some of the butchers. It, it actually wasn't any one group of people, but people that were doing great on Monday and doing great on Tuesday. And then, you know, later in the week, because we got paid on Friday, on Thursday, they'd be a little bit sick. And on Friday, they'd be itching their skin because they were dope sick. Their paycheck ran out. 
and they're awaiting for their next paycheck to pay their uh, so they could get their fix. And this cycle started with overuse injuries. You know, people getting prescribed uh, opioids to help with the pain of life, but also the pain of just the physical demand of the meat industry, of the overuse and repetitive motions. But prescriptions run out. And doctors, even though they do overprescribe, they don't want to be your drug dealer because uh, that also makes them look bad. Uh, so these people found would, you know, try to get the same pills on the street where you would be paying like 20 to $40 a pill. Um, but what was a lot cheaper was heroin. Now, the 91 freeway splits New Hampshire and Vermont and comes from New York City and goes straight into Canada. And you got heroin going up as the corridor, and you got marijuana coming down. That's one of the main reasons why New England's hit so hard by the opioid crisis or the heroin epidemic. One thing I learned is that it seems like amphetamines aren't that popular in climates that are cold because I feel like they would make you want to get out and do something where you're on heroin you could just chill and it wasn't just the entry level workers who were on this regiment of pain management you know some of the old cutters who would never consider consider themselves drug addicts would you know at break time, someone would take a uh, Vicodin for their hand. And and one of the other old cutters would be like, oh, do you want one to another person that was old? And, you know, they wouldn't give it to the younger guys. They'd be like, no, this is, you know, we've been in this industry. We, we need this. And then one of them would be like, well, what is this? I need to talk to my doctor and get me some of these because I feel way better. You know, not saying that they're, they're drug addicts, but it's certainly a culture or a environment that, you know, doesn't look down on it. You really shouldn't be, it should, it goes without saying, you shouldn't be sharing your scripts with anyone. You should be selling them. Nah, I'm joking. And at this facility, there was also a bunch of mood, mood lighting or moon lighting, you know, and if you don't know what that is, that's when you work in the evenings uh, in any industry, either for, for cash or to get something done. Mood lighting in a butcher shop is its very different. It, it's Or in a processing facility. I, first time I did it, the person who was in charge was like, oh, Travis, there's uh, something in the back for you. And I go back there and it's a line of cocaine. And as I've mentioned previously in this episode, I have had my struggles with it. And I was the first time I was presented with this problem since I, was sober and I politely declined and you know it, that was the end of that and this culture went unchecked for a very long time and when my brother became the GM he did everything to squash it on the kill floor you know before that people would be drinking there'd be a 30 pack of natty ice in the holding pins and you just go out there and have a have a beer people would you know move their apron to the side and pee behind the scolder. There was many lines. It was like uh, uh, hedonism. It was like a the complete debauchery, but with no women. So my brother put an end to that on the kill floor, and people thought he was joking, and he, he just suspended people. He would tell people they couldn't show up to work or they would have to go home. Uh, he place a write-up facility and this was met with hesitation by the manager of the cut room because he was the number one uh, proponent of this he was the number one person in a management power position and he was just as bad not as or even worse as anyone else he was dope sick he would 
his hands cramped a little bit, he would come back and like leave, come back in like 10 minutes and he would be super great because he just, you know, took some H. And the day I got my finger cut off and as I'm rushing out of the plant, holding my hand above my head while my hand bleeds all over me, he said, if they give you any good pills, they're mine. So that's was the cut room management style. Also about this is because of this, there was tit for tat favors. I'll give you this for that. And it bred a very unhealthy relationship where there were no boundaries. Everyone knew everyone's business because these people would hang out with each other or not these people, but a large majority of the people I worked with would hang out with one another after. Now, not, not everyone I worked with did this. Uh, there were, you know, really good old school cutters who just shared Vicodin with each other every once in a while. And I just want to end this by saying, you know, I, I try to find meaning and ways to tie shit up. I'm afraid that I'm going to fall short here. But if you're working in an environment, you know, and or you yourself find yourself doing behavior that could be more than just a Friday or Saturday night thing. And I certainly have no problems with recreational drugs. Um, I don't do them, uh, you know, but I don't look my nose down on anything. Also, people change, too, because, you know, like, to quote Jim Mullaney, in his latest comedy stand-up is that the night he graduated college, he was smoking cocaine. Now he's performing at the Radio City Music Hall. So if you're finding yourself in a situation where you're feeling out of control, just know nothing is forever. And nothing is permanent, be that where you work, a relationship you're in, a living situation, or a substance problem, or a mental state. This isn't some bullshit saying that you have what it takes to fix it. But it is certainly okay to ask for help. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help. And that dark time in your life or period in your life does not define you for the rest of your life. And you certainly could go through that and get your shit together if you see if it's one of those things and never talk about that history again. Just if anyone ever asks you, it's personal. You don't have to tell them. I rarely talk about this, but I'm telling it in this platform where everyone will hear it. But just know nothing is permanent and nothing is forever. Except for death. Everybody that really knows what's going on in this country, the people that control the news media, that are on the news media, they're saying that uh, the narcotics problem has reached epidemic proportions. Everybody looks at the young people and talks about the young people when they talk about narcotics. Well, there are those of us, too, that know that the narcotic problem is not just with the young people. The problem is in most all age groups, especially those who are past the teenage. I would like to do you a song that's Got a heavy, powerful message. The message is that after the thrill that you get from a pill or from the pot or from the shots, there is a horror that comes later. And you might think it's in bad taste to do something like this for television. You might think that something like this should not be done. But I would say if it would save one person from the horrors 
that come after the thrill, it would have been worth it. This bed that I lay on is narrow and cold. The sickness inside me, it tears at my soul. And the devil awaits me, he calls me his son. For he knows I'm cornered and too weak to run. For I soon must return to a gutter of thrill where joy is the needle or a bottle of pills where a man welcomes misery like an old friend from home that he uses and abuses till the misery is gone my mind's filled with torture my body's in pain but the needle is warm as it sinks in the vein and just a matter of seconds my mind will be free from the coldness and darkness that dominates me but the freedom is short-lived again I'm alone I must find the pusher But my money is all gone Then the cycle of horror Starts over once more Oh God Don't let me suffer that misery no more. Keep your knife sharp and live in the margin.